Okay, so good morning, everyone, and thank you for tuning in for another Risk Institute online session. Um, today, we're really fortunate to have with us two speakers, Benjamin Shire and Dr. Michael Cohn, uh, to speak to us on their project, MicroCOVID, uh, using limited data to create a practical model uh, for predicting COVID um, and MicroCOVID. So uh, we're really fortunate to have with us uh, Benjamin Shire, who graduated from Massachusetts Institute for Technology, um, doing electrical engineering and computer science. Uh, he's also worked at Google, uh, working on the kind of Google Home application, um, and then did a little bit of a spin-off, doing a startup um, in electric electrical health uh, recording, um, and is also now working on the micro COVID application, uh, leading the research for the model um, that they've been developing. Uh, there's also Dr. Michael Cohn from the University of Michigan, who's also, uh, well, he's graduated from the University of Michigan doing his PhD. Sorry, let me just get the, a little bit more of the information. Social psych psychologist and user experience researcher with a PhD in psychology from the University of Michigan. And he worked on the Google Maps features. Uh, you may have seen some of his work or rather not seen it since his job there was to make sure that they that new features didn't get in the way of people's di everyday directions and safety needs. And at MicroCOVID, he helps the team translate the messy complexities of virus transmission into terms that help real life users make choices. He's also the deputy, deputy director of research at votetripling.org. Um, so without further ado, if I'd like to pass over the, the stage to you guys and you can start the presentation. Thank you. I think Ben is going to uh, get us started and then I will jump in later in the talk. To, uh, I will as soon as I figure out how to present on Zoom. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, they call it share screen. <laughs> no problems. If, uh, if you have any issues, just send me the link and I can share it on my screen too. Okay. We can see that. Fantastic. Oh, no, you, you're muted. We can't hear you. Yeah, I was wondering whether I was having an audio problem. Sorry, Ben. I think you've muted yourself. Hello? Okay. So it's, Okay, we can hear you now. It's me when I share my screen. Uh, and then I can turn off with audio share. Okay. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Ben Uh That's your screen. Wait, what's going on? But can you see my screen? I see. We can we can see your screen and we can see okay. you and we can hear you. So I think it's uh it's all running okay. You stop sharing your screen now though. Uh, okay. Sorry for the difficulties. No stress. Um, all right. Uh, my name is Ben Vincea, and I'm going to be talking about how we built a model for COVID risk at MicroCOVID and talk about why we built a model despite having a lot of uncertainty and how we both try to use our model to reduce uncertainty for a lot of people and how we try and cope and present with our uncertainty in our own model. Um, for those of you who haven't seen MicroCode, I'm going to hop over to our website. Uh, and so what MicroCovid is, is a tool for entering kind of the parameters of an activity or relationship or um, flatting situation that you have and kind of figure out how risky is this in a numeric scale so that you can compare it against other things, either other risky, um, other COVID risk activities, or you can compare it against, you know, what's your risk of dying from COVID from going grocery shopping this week versus uh, your risk of dying from driving 
to your vacation this year. Uh, so I'm going to quickly walk us through the uh, microCOVID page. Uh, so the first thing we have folks do is enter their location. And we do a daily ingestion of COVID uh, case reports uh, in all the counties in the United States. And then we also have a um, number of locations outside the United States. So we can do, and we only have, uh, within England, we have granularity uh, of uh, England, but not sub regions. And then you might say, we, we ask kind of, what are you trying to figure out? So you might say, how risky is it to go to a grocery store uh, for 60 minutes? And that fills out the rest of the form with some standard values. And it's looking at, are you vaccinated? How many people are going to be near you at any given time? How far are you keeping from people? Um, how risky are the people around you? Usually at a grocery store, you wouldn't know much. So you'd say they're just an average person. Um, what kind of masks are you wearing? What's the ventilation? And from all of this, we derive some numeric risk. Uh, in this case, 31 micro COVIDs or 31 parts per million chance of getting COVID in this interaction. And then to convert a number of micro COVIDs into a, can I do this or not? We came up with this concept of a weekly risk budget, which basically is an attempt to say, I would like to match my risk of serious long-term health effects to the risk of serious long-term health effects from the distance a person drives in an average year. Uh, from here, users can experiment with what happens if they change parameters. For instance, a user might say that they're 31 micro COVID is a rather high risk for something they want to do every week. And they can investigate, for instance, what happens if they wear a higher grade mask. Uh, and they can also compare, say, 16 micro COVIDs from uh, this grocery store to you know, what happened. How does this compare to going to a bar? Uh, which I have on a Google card, which pops up a whopping 18,000 micro COVIDs. So you can tell that uh, going to a bar is significantly more dangerous than doing your grocery shopping. So how did we get here? Um, so the original team micro COVID was six housemates who just needed to figure out how to live together. And they were housemates before the pandemic started and all had slightly different preferences for how to live during the pandemic. And they all had slightly different risk preferences and they all had slightly different ideas of what was risky. Uh, today, none of those six housemates are actively on the team, and we're a rotating cast of volunteers uh, worldwide to keep the project running and up to date. Back in April of 2020, uh, a common thing we would hear is there, there isn't enough known about COVID-19 to quantify risk. Uh, or people would say uh, no model is better than a bad model and you can't make a good model with what we know. And I'm going to challenge this. I propose that no model, quote, no model of COVID is a model. So every day uh, in the pandemic, whether or not you have a model of COVID, you have to make a lot of decisions. Do I go out for a run? Can I go grocery shopping? Can I eat takeout? Can I see friends outside, inside? I cough. Do I need to isolate from my housemates? And these are all decisions that you must make. And for some folks, the answer is COVID might be risky and 
therefore no to all of these or the safest version of all of these. And that means that you're weighing the value of an activity against the risk of COVID and deciding that the risk of COVID outweighs the benefits of the activities, which is uh, from a economics or behavioral standpoint, a model. It's saying COVID is infinitely risky, infinitely bad and high enough risk. So when you don't have a model, what's happening when you make these decisions? Well, you have some situation and your brain makes some decision. Uh, how does your brain make that decision? Well, our brains are neural nets in the most literal sense of the word. And neural nets are trained from all the inputs on it. And our brains are trained on past experience, but also uh, TV, Twitter, Facebook, uh, certain US presidents who are loud on some of these platforms. And that's what's going into training your network to make a decision. And for folks who study uh, ML or AI, what you know is that if the uh, training model, training data that you use to train your neural net is not very well suited to the decision that neural net needs to make, you tend to get a uh, decision out of the neural net that uh, is at best a bad decision and kind of more commonly a nonsense decision. In other words, uh, garbage in, garbage out. So hopefully we've convinced folks that we must have a model because if we don't have an explicit model, we have an implicit model. And it'd be better to have a model based on data, even incomplete data, than uh, the implicit model that we're going to have, which is based on tweets and sound bites, maybe past medical trauma that really doesn't have a way for the brain to correlate it onto the correct magnitude of risk for COVID. So we early on saw some qualitative models um, come out and circulate on the web. Um, kind of the most common was the, the Texas Medical Association uh, nine point scale. I am somewhat convinced that all three of these infographics are based off the original one on the left, um, but they don't really cite that. And this basically says some things are riskier than others. There's general things that make something riskier. Uh, lots of people, no masks indoors. And this was like a very big help for uh, most people who at this point had no concept of, you know, what's dangerous. And folks are say washing their groceries or taking a shower when they come home, which at, within a few months, we had pretty good data that that wasn't really how COVID spread. We had since that it was either large particles from coughs or uh, aerosols. Um, and there was increasingly evidence for aerosol transmission. So this became a way for people to have a discussion and center their beliefs on something that was a little bit more based on facts. Um, and there's some problems with a qualitative model so what's a low risk? What's a high risk? Uh, how much riskier is category two than six? Can I do like three category two activities and that's the same as uh, a category six activity? Um, also, how did they make this chart? And there's some strange things like why is a dinner party indoors the same riskiness as going to a beach outdoors? That seems a little bit strange. And ultimately the question is, what am I allowed to do? What do I feel safe to do? And what do I feel comfortable with my housemates doing? And you can use this to say, oh, we can just do anything below three. And that seems like, it puts a lot of trust in this system that we can't really see into. It also uh, does not have every activity in the world on it. 
And so a lot gets left out and is left for discussions. And what we found was uh, the six original creators had rules basically with this qualitative model of here are activities we can do and everything else we need to discuss uh, in committee. And there's an infinite number of activities. So there is an infinite amount of time spent in meetings. So when you have this qualitative model, you start making kind of arbitrary compromises. How many times can I get takeout? Maybe twice a week? Why twice a week? I don't know. That's what I feel like is safe. Um, you can go on walks outside, but you also need to wear a mask because uh, you know the government said wear a mask. I have that twice. Um, grocery shopping. Yeah, you can go grocery shopping, but your parents who are isolated and not seeing anyone else, you can't see them. You can see people in our pod. You can't see people outside of our pod, even if they're doing the same sorts of things. Uh, and it was an absolute mess. So what happens if you have a quantitative model? Well, first you can start to quantify uncertainty. If you, if you can say, well, this is probably between these riskinesses. You can make decisions between options. So we can say, oh, this activity is twice as risky as this activity. And you have a budget. So you can do this thing once or this thing twice. And that's fine. It will be the same risk to everyone else in the house. Uh, and we can assess and communicate risk. So if there's a novel activity that someone wants to do, we would be able to use a quantitative model to say how risky this is and then put it in context with everything else we're doing. Is seeing our parents actually more dangerous than the grocery shopping that we agree is OK? So let's make a model. Um, so from first principles, we're getting this sense from scientists that uh, COVID is primarily spread through aerosols. And aerosols are kind of in the center of this diagram are pretty well understood. You breathe some out and you ventilate some out. Some of them settle, maybe they get deactivated. And uh, once they're in the room, you can inhale them. They get put into the room by people exhaling them. And if you get some number of COVID particles in your lungs, you probably get infected. Uh, and the problem with this is there's two really, really big unknowns and unstudied. So even today, I have not seen a paper describing how many viral particles are exhaled per hour by a person infected with COVID. And I also have not seen a model studying how many particles of COVID it takes to get infected. The other problem with a model that is simulating physics at this granularity is it's very hard to intuit. So there's a number of exponential and feedback functions in this, which makes it hard to develop an intuition. So the team said, let's try and go from the top down. The risk of getting COVID must be the risk of people in your activity having COVID times the chance of getting COVID from a person who is infected. And this became the base of the micro COVID uh, model, person risk and activity risk. So we can break each of these down. Uh, the risk of people present having COVID can be modeled as the risk of them getting COVID, i.e. how many micro COVIDs they gain over the last two to nine days, which is a window that is derived from uh, this estimation of 90% of transmission occurring in that time. So basically, it's a recursive model where if you know your micro COVIDs, you can use that to calculate uh, the micro COVIDs of the next person you're going to interact with. Or if you don't know that, you can say that the risk of a random person drawn from a population having COVID is equal to the number of people infected this week in the region divided by the population. So 
random sample. And that's kind of a tricky thing to know because we have COVID tests that don't actually test every person in the area. And uh, the original team developed a model based on uh, seroprevalence for determining how many actual COVID infections there were as a function of how many tests were positive and what percentage of tests were positive. We've since uh, given up on being the experts on this and have deferred to a uh, project called uh, COVID-19 projections, which use, did an ML model for determining the number of true infections. Uh, so the activity risk is more complicated. We know that in reality, it's some nonlinear function of particles emitted and inhalation and the dynamics in a room. But what the team did was they said, let's take all of the major factors and let's kind of do a first order linear model of them. So the things that we know probably increase COVID transmission are how long the activity is, uh, the being closer together and how much people are emitting um, particles and the things that you can do to reduce this risk, which you know, every government agency is saying is um, wear masks and have an area that's better ventilated. So either outside or a room that has a higher airflow. And so the team went out and they looked through all the papers they could find to figure out uh, what studies looked at kind of hazard ratios for each of these functions. And it turns out that there are way more functions that way more papers that published hazard ratios for basically do masks work, does distance work? Uh, what is the hazard ratio of run when you run a HEPA filter? And so from this, they were able to get values for all of these uh, multipliers. So ultimately, the microcode model became a series of multipliers uh, representing risks and mitigations. And it only includes factors that had major effects on the final score. Um, so for instance, getting a PCR test three or four days in advance did not seem to have a major fact effect. So we left out uh, that from the model. And kind of the beautiful thing of microcovid is it could be calculated by hand or in your head. Um, most of the folks who did a lot of work on the model knew all the multipliers in their head and could, uh, in like before going to activity, just run those numbers in their head and be like, oh, this is 12 microcovid, six microcovids, 3,000 microcovids, without needing to use any uh, tooling. Um, the other thing is that each of these multipliers are based on published value. So we could show all the papers that we use and how we derive these numbers. And other people could either verify the number or say, actually, I don't agree on this interpretation. I think that N95 masks are much safer than that. I'm going to use 1 20th instead of 1 8th. Uh, and a note on substituting values, actually, it's not the order. Um, okay, so what does that look like? That looks like a big spreadsheet. Um, so the original team built a huge spreadsheet and uh, wiped their hands and said, okay, we're done. People enter their values here and we will uh, get a number at the end. And it turned out that uh, a lot of people don't like spreadsheets and are scared of these big walls of numbers. So we ended up making a website, which and Michael is going to talk more about the uh, UX and how we rethought UX to be friendly. Uh, Okay, this is the website. So 
let's say the scene. So I mentioned we would quantify uncertainty in the micro COVID model. And the way we did that was we took kind of all of the parameters that we had gotten from papers and looked at the uncertainties that had been published and put it through a tool called guesstimate, which lets you combine a bunch of distributions and get a um, final uh, range of possibilities. And this was kind of a loose and fast way to measure um, uncertainty uh, because there's a lot of uncertainty about the uncertainty. Um, so for one, we know pretty confidently that COVID transmission isn't linear. So the uncertainty is actually going to change with how long an activity lasts. Um, we also don't know how good the studies are. Did they do their uncertainty analysis correctly? Were they really measuring the thing that uh, they needed to measure? Um, were they accounting for false negatives when testing their contact tracing? Um, and also our uncertainty analysis is now very well out of date. COVID keeps changing and data keeps coming out. Uh, so we are long overdue to update our uncertainty analysis. Uh, for the most part, we just say we're probably within a factor of three plus or minus. Um, and that is something that we could do better and possibly something that uh, someone here would be interested in helping us with. Um, and the final uncertainty is uh, correlation versus causation. So if a factor is true in a uh, observational study, there is kind of no check that once you tell people to change their behavior that the effect is going to be the same. Okay. All this it kind of leads to a lot of concern that the team had with what microCOVID became. Um, they never meant to be a source of truth. They are uh, not infectious disease experts and they originally wanted to just have a way for the six of them to coexist and maybe have people buy into it so that they could interact together and maybe be a demonstration to other people that there is a lot known about COVID-19. You can do research, you can make your own decisions. Uh, and you should kind of pick your own things that are important, pick your own papers that you trust. Instead, what we ended up doing, having happen was a lot of people around the world will simply cite a link to micro COVID as a rationale for their behaviors, which is uh, both touching and a thing that we're really proud of and a thing that I find really scary because I am a uh, electrical engineer and software engineer and I'm not a uh, public health professional. Uh, so an example of this happening uh, was when I was trying to negotiate COVID risk for a ski trip I was going on. And I uh, asked like, hey, can we use this you know, 0.2x risk multiplier for the vaccines uh, for someone who had just gotten vaccinated uh, in February, very early before there was really a lot of data on the vaccines. And someone said, yeah, I think we can use that. It's landed in micro COVID, so it's legit. I'm like, it's landed in micro COVID, but I just came up with that number. I feel like I'm giving way too much trust uh, in these circles. Um, and of course, I'm trying to do my best to interpret the data, but it is a very big change from previously anything that I had suggested would be a point of like major discussion and being asked to cite sources, but now I can just cite the sources somewhere hidden in the micro COVID uh, white paper, put up a number and 
people magically trust me to know what I'm talking about. Uh, so there's also some hazards that came with this uh, kind of soapbox that we found ourselves on. So originally we had sus suspected that uh, doctors or people who work from uh, offices or in grocery stores would be double to triple the risk of an average person. And this results in a lot of doctors saying, or nurses saying, hey, my friends are like hanging out with each other but won't see me because you say I'm riskier than them. Um, and when we went back and looked at the data, we found uh, that, well, so first we were worried, you know, even if this is true, is it acceptable for us to marginalize a group that is doing essential work? And on top of that, when we looked at the data, we found that this uh, increased risk was true for only the first few months of the pandemic, when uh, offices had not implemented sufficient precautions, people who were working with the public were far more likely to get COVID. And later in the pandemic, this was no longer true. So we were actually publishing false information, and it was hurting people. Uh, and we fixed that, and then people complained that we had uh, we, we were changing things for uh, the purpose of not marginalizing people. And we're like, no, actually, the data is pretty clear at this point. Um, another problem was that overestimating protection may lead to unsafe behavior. One of the members uh, was very worried that we would say, oh, you know, it's safe to hang out in X, Y, Z situation. And if we were wrong, then a bunch of people go out and do this and get COVID, some of them die. Now we're partially responsible. Also understating protection leads to loss utility or not using things that are really available. So when we didn't have sufficient data on N95 or P100 masks, uh, we, simply didn't say anything about them on the website. And that led to people not knowing that there is a very good tool for reducing COVID risk that is not very expensive and pretty easy to get. Um, uh, we currently have this problem with PCR or rapid tests where we're having trouble quantifying the protection that taking a test before an activity grants and therefore we aren't saying anything and therefore people are kind of falling back to their uh, model based on whatever other people are saying or whatever is in the media about how well rapid tests work. I'm going to hand it over to Michael now to talk about how we worked on making microcovid usable and accessible. Thanks, Ben. Uh, just as a quick check, where are we on time? We're on uh, 37 minutes past, um, but if you want to talk for 15, 20 minutes, I think that should be fine. Okay, and Ben, can you stop sharing your screen so I can take over? All right. Awesome. So yeah, my name is Michael. I um, joined the MicroCovid project just about a year ago. Uh, I found out about it the same way that I think most people did. I have, I saw it somewhere online. I don't remember where, uh, but when you know the folks I live with were talking about how we were going to handle Thanksgiving 2020 and whether their parents should visit and you know how much it was okay to go out and things, I told them about this great site I'd seen that made some pretty reasonable assumptions and extrapolations from the technical data. And we looked at it and it helped us all, you know, come together around a shared way of thinking about things. And I was just really excited by what Ben and his group had done in terms of taking like the knowledge that had been published 
in technical articles and trying to translate it into terms that people actually use to make decisions in their lives. So I wrote to them and asked, hey, I think there's a lot of potential for this to be used even more widely. Can I help you with some user research? And so my job on the project was to sit down with folks who were from the type of community that could find this useful uh, in terms of wanting to quantify risk, in terms of wanting to be responsible, also in terms of having some of the privileges that allow you to decide, you know, I'm going to have groceries delivered or I'm going to make an extra effort to work from home, but who also had some pressures to, uh, you know, be in the world. I sat down with folks, I asked them to take a look at the site and use it. And my goal was to figure out what can we do to make this more widely accessible. So I'm going to go through just a few of the things that came up during user testing and how we responded to them. And the first thing was, what do people do when they see the site for the first time? So at the time, this is what the main page to the site looked like. Uh, there's a lot here to look at. But we designed this uh, as people do because we want because we thought these were the things people needed to see before they could jump in and use the site. So we figured they need to know, is the site up to date? So we have this info here about uh, the update for the B117 variant. We have the info about how this site is based on the best research available because people want to know, can they trust the site? We describe what a micro COVID is because the site doesn't make a lot of sense otherwise. And we explain the concept of a risk budget because that's kind of the statistical premise underlying the entire site that you can run a certain amount of risk over a certain amount of time in order to keep your entire risk at a certain level. Uh, when I sat down and looked at the site with people, I asked them, you know, tell me about your experiences with COVID, tell me what your concerns are, tell me um, what you're doing now to try and minimize risk. And again, all kinds of fascinating things came out from that. But when we showed them the site, they had some pretty common reactions. Um, like first, right out of the gate, seeing this right at the top, they said, I, parameters, B1, B117, I think most of them had heard in the media that there was a new variant going around, but it was just kind of alphabet soup for them. And the language they used, a lot of people actually said, this isn't for people like me. And I think if they had just come upon the site, they probably would have closed it right then because they, they thought this is going to be really technical. This only makes sense if I already know all this stuff. Um, some of them also used the word nerds, but generally, yeah, it was a feeling that they were left out here. Uh, they didn't care what it said here at all. They're used to websites starting with some happy talk that tells you some things and that wasn't important to them. Uh, no one actually was very curious about what micro COVID meant. One person said, oh, I thought it meant it was a tiny website. Um, and then finally risk budget again, set off that reaction of uh, this is jargon. This is, you know, this means I don't belong here. Uh, fortunately, we did still have the, uh, header for the calculator above the fold on the page. And people saw that and then they were excited again. They said, oh, this is telling me something I need to know. Now I'm willing to dig in and figure out how to use it. So we started with a few assumptions. Uh, the people would be skeptical. I needed to, convince, needed to be convinced that they could trust the site, that people would want to understand what the tool was gonna tell them before they put in their time, and that people wanted some context before diving in. And we learned what I think is really relevant for the entire enterprise kind of scientific communication for the public is people wanted to see the site was relevant for them. First of all, they wanted to know, will this tell me things that I need in a way that I can understand? Uh, they needed to see something that was immediately understandable, not something that could be explained to them. And they really did want to dive in, which is, is actually a pretty common thing where people see a new tool and then they get confused and lost because they didn't read the documentation. But what we learned from that is that they need to have things explained step by step as they get there rather than reading it all at once at the beginning. And I want to go back and say, like, if, if you study user experience or design, some of these things might seem pretty obvious to you. But I think it's interesting that we were designing this for kind of the most friendly audience possible for people 
who are either in the rationalist community or kind of adjacent to that, ones who like probability, ones who like research. And even for them, uh, these more human needs are the ones that were predominant when they were deciding whether to jump in and use the site. So after some initial revisions, we ended up with some changes. Uh, I think this is still far from as usable or as appealing as it possibly could be, but I think we made some big improvements. Um, when Delta became the new strain of concern, we came up with a uh, update notification that was, I think, a lot more human readable, saying things kind of more clearly. We centered the introductory language around specific scenarios. We made it clear that these are collapsible sections that you can read, but that aren't necessary. And we managed to pull the start of the calculator at least a little bit farther up the page and describe it in a little bit clearer terms. I'll jump now to the end of the experience using the calculator. That was another place we saw some really interesting responses. So this is all what you get once you've put all your information into the calculator. At the top, it shows you, you know, is this roughly low risk, medium risk, high risk? Uh, what's the number of micro COVIDs and so forth? We could absolutely do a whole talk on how we constructed this section and how we tried to put the risk in terms that people could reason about easily. Uh, then below that, we have some harm reduction advice. And the part I want to talk about is down at the very bottom of the page where it asks, do you want to adjust your risk tolerance? You know, are you someone who um, maybe has comorbidities, is more concerned about developing COVID or giving it to someone else, in which case you might want to have a smaller risk budget? Alternately, are you someone who's an essential worker where uh, you might have to have a higher risk budget? And when people saw this, they were really interested. They were kind of confused about why we hadn't put this farther up. Like, why didn't you let me adjust this before? And we, I kind of knew this was potentially an issue. I asked people in their initial interviews about what they thought of as the amount of risk they were willing to run. Um, and I asked them, okay, what would you want to set this to? And they found that really hard to answer. Um, they really stopped. And it was really hard. And people were just not sure what to do about this. Uh, some of them said, well, I want my risk to be zero. And we know that that's first of all impossible and second of all empirically untrue. People accept all kinds of risks. But no one had really thought about quantitatively what risk am I willing to take? And I think, I, you know, if you're an epidemiologist, you might have some understanding of, okay, what's my base rate risk of dying over a year? What's my risk of dying from, like Ben mentioned, from driving a car? But I don't know those numbers off the top of my head and no one else did either. And so uh, it was interesting. I ended up concluding that this had actually been a pretty good design choice. I initially thought to myself, yeah, this is a bad UI principle, just having this one menu hanging out at the bottom of the page away from everything. But what it accomplished was that, you know, it nudged people towards a default risk tolerance that we had figured out was reasonable based on uh, both an epidemiological understanding of what would happen if everybody ran a 1% risk and based on looking at other risks that people accept in life. So I think that was actually a really helpful decision uh, for our users. That said, it does leave some people out, right? If you are one of those people who's at higher risk, or if you are an essential worker who still wants to limit your risk, but you know 1% is just unattainable for you, then those folks didn't really see this option and didn't know that the site would be more useful to them. So I don't think we ever really nailed the best way to get risk tolerance on there. That's becoming an even more prominent issue now when um, people are thinking, well, since I'm vaccinated, maybe I'm willing to run a higher risk of getting COVID since my risk of having a severe or fatal case is still low. Um, those are all complications that I think we are still struggling with along with the rest of the world. But overall, I think um, the choice architecture here of setting people on a default of 1% ended up working really well. It, it made the site usable for people. I'll just one other talk, one other topic, which is hugging. Um, 
we've heard from a lot of people who use the micro COVID site that they were feeling really isolated and the site helped them understand things that it was acceptable for them to do. Uh, we heard from people who said, you know, yeah. And in particular, for people who weren't living with a family or a partner, uh, the lack of physical touch was really hard on them throughout the first year of the pandemic. And also we know genuinely bad for their health. So it's, it's by far uh, not something that should be regarded as like a no cost thing to lose. But people thought hugging was just really unthinkable, right? Because you're very close to another person. But when you run it through micro COVID, um, taking into account the factors that we think are important, you also find it's a very short duration interaction, uh, usually less than a minute. It's something you can do while you're both masked. Uh, usually people are not talking while they're hugging, so they're not expelling a lot of particles. And I tried, I shared this information with a lot of people I know, and they were both intrigued and kind of resistant to it because so much of the original communication and, you know, March through like summer of 2020, remember the Wuhan shake and painful looking elbow bumps and just generally all the images of physical isolation. The idea of touching was really disturbing for people. And, you know, it's, to this day, I think we are still struggling to get out the message that no, you know, fomites were just wrong, uh, at least for COVID. Like you're probably stopping people from getting the flu, but uh, that touch is not actually a very high contagion risk. Um, when you actually put in the parameters as best I could figure out for giving someone a hug uh, in micro COVID, the numbers are just about as low as we're capable of displaying. And in fact, this is an overestimate because the site wasn't designed to handle interactions that last less than a minute. So sharing this with people uh, for me has been really interesting. And just uh, anecdotally, I'll mention, you know, I, uh, I have a friend, Brandon, who spent the first year of the pandemic it's very difficult for him. He was very worried about COVID. He has respiratory problems. He didn't want to develop it. He was horrified by the idea of giving it to someone else. He didn't leave his apartment very much. He dealt with a lot of anger at people who weren't masking properly, um, had conflict with his family. Uh, you know, I, I shared the site with him and he used it a lot. And I talked to him specifically about how hugging worked. And then uh, in June of this year, back during kind of the intermission when before Delta was huge, when vaccines were actually pretty darn effective, I went and visited some friends uh, lives in Texas and we had a, uh, an outdoor gathering of vaccinated people. When he saw me, he threw his arms open and he said, it's Michael, the man who brought hugging back into my life. And that was kind of the moment where I was like, all right, we've done something good here, you know, for all of the uncertainty and usability difficulties with micro COVID like this, we won. Uh, that made a difference. So to sum up a few things from what we learned. When people were looking at the main page of the site, we found you can get people to invest time in qualitative risk reduction thinking if you can make the leap to showing personal and emotional relevance to them. And that specific issue of this isn't for people like me was a really big barrier. Um, when we had people looking at the risk budget, again, you know, people can learn to think in terms of harm reduction and in terms of relative risk. Ben mentioned one of the valuable things is being able to think, you know, is outdoor dining twice the same as visiting someone in their house once. That kind of thing is intuitive to people. Absolute risk is not as intuitive to people, I think. Um, when trying to communicate, it's always helpful to contextualize it. And the choice architecture here can make a huge difference because you can give people that comparison frame to work with. And finally, when it comes to physical contact, that um, there's always, I think, a, a tendency to want to tell people things they should worry about, but telling them what not to worry about can also be very powerful in terms of helping them make useful choices. So that wraps up what I wanted to share about our experience with 
uh, micro COVID. And I think at this point, we're happy to turn it over for discussion and questions. I see we have a couple queued up here already. Um, asking yeah, did we follow up? Sorry, go ahead, Michael. You can answer the question if you like. I just asked, did we follow up what happened to people who uh, followed that advice? And the answer is no, we've never been able to run micro COVID as an epidemiological experiment. Also, I think uh, our user, Ben mentioned our users are both atypical enough and you know still small enough in number, I don't think we could get statistically very good data on that. So um, I'm relatively confident in our inference that that's not the biggest thing they should worry about, but uh, we have not demonstrated that empirically. Yeah, thank you so much, Michael and Ben, for your talk. That was really, really fascinating. Um, and just great to hear two different perspectives um, from, from both of you. Uh, so I'd also like to open the, fl the floor up for any questions, but just to get the ball rolling, um, I'm wondering why uh, you both haven't included the kind of the risk of death or other, other mm -hmm. issues and complications that may arise, hospitalization, for example, from the data that might be available. Because I know a lot of people, um, at least in my area, that aren't so worried about catching COVID, but they're more worried about the risk of the impact of COVID necessarily mm -hmm. and who they have. Uh, I wonder if that's a consideration that you guys have thought about in, the, in your model at all. Absolutely. Um, and so the thing that we model is how likely are you to get COVID because that's a like useful currency. So if you have COVID, you know, if you have a 50% chance of having COVID and then you go interact with someone else, that's the number that they want to know before interacting with you. In terms of the risk of like how much COVID risk should you tolerate that risk budget that we're talking about, that's entirely based on what's the impact of getting COVID. Oh, right. Okay. And so there's kind of three outcomes that people worry about, right? There's dying, there's hospitalization, and then there's the kind of more nebulous long-term effects of COVID, sometimes called long COVID, sometimes called post-acute uh, COVID syndrome. Um, and of those three, the long COVID outcome is by far the most common. And so when we kind of pick like, what is our budget? You look at, well, let's match the risk of death to other things in our lives, let's match the risk of um, hospitalization to other Nothing. things in our lives, let's match the risk of long COVID to other things in our lives. And the then we like pick the lowest of those three budgets, right? And the lowest one is matching long-term impairment or long COVID. Uh, and that gives us the 1% budget. Okay, right. Yeah, sorry. That that wasn't obvious to me when I was uh, reading the page, but it's good to know that you guys have factored, factored that in. Um, there's a few other questions I have, but firstly, does anyone from the audience have any questions that they'd like to, to chime in with? Yeah, I do have one because I'm leaving in a minute. Um, so I think what Michael explained, I think it's really important to ask the, the public what, what they are thinking and how will they use it. And I think it is very important to include the risk perception so whatever so as we learned um, already as as you can you can put as many facts uh, in or, or to the public as you want but if if the risk perception is totally different they will not listen and i think this is a psychological uh, <laughs> effect which is really tricky uh, um, to be, to put in into these measurements and i think these um, you know you can't predict. You can't predict what people are doing. You can't predict what people are thinking. No matter what you what what facts you put out. Um, and the second point is, um, as Francis just mentioned. Um, so, did you follow up the when when someone said, "Okay, hacking is no longer a problem because it's such a short term. You can wear mask. You don't have to speak." Um, did you follow up? What did people experience? Uh, first of all, if you said, okay, hugging is a really, really important thing because this physical contact is a basic need, a human basic need. And second, uh, did they get any any wires? So did you follow up these participants you interviewed? This would be really interesting because this could see how their risk perception could have changed probably. Uh, we haven't done follow-ups with people who have 
use the site. I know we've gotten a lot of qualitative comments from people. I mentioned we've heard some things coming in from people who said that, you know, it was psychologically very good for them. Um, ben, do you have any particular stories you know of from folks who reported on how the site affected them? Yeah, um, so yeah. we don't have, we haven't done proper follow-ups in, in the way a clinical study would, but we do have a lot of uh, people who comment that micro COVID saved their group house or relationship um, by getting them, helping them align on risks. Um, we get a lot of people saying that it changed, like it got them to change what their parents were doing in some cases, making them be more cautious. Um, in some cases, we got people thanking us for letting them feel permission to go on outdoor walks. Um, so uh, we, we do yeah. have a lot of anecdotal data that it moved risk perceptions both up and down uh, for a large number of people. I think this would be really important to look deeper into it uh, because this would um, help to trust your your tool and to give the the people who use it more confidence to make sure they are on the right track. Um, because I'm I'm investigating older adults and they were more in need probably than than other people. I, I'm not sure, but um, at least the participants I'm interviewing they were in huge need to to hack and have this physical contact with with family members and friends. And and to get a, a guarantee, I'm allowed to, would help them. As, you know, overcome the loneliness yeah. and anxiety they all experienced. Is yeah. your question um, whether or not hugging is actually safe? For this individual, yes. It's always an individual decision, isn't it? Yeah, so we, we are not aware of anyone who has gotten COVID from a hug, and we are also not aware of any user who has gotten COVID while following a 1% risk budget. Um, okay. That doesn't mean they don't exist, but my expectation is that if someone was following our advice and got COVID, they would have like sent us an angry email. I think what you said is actually a really interesting demonstration of the two, the two perspectives that kind of align and sometimes clash here, because the way we think about it is that there are, the degree of risk that you're willing to accept is to some extent a very individual thing. It's different for each person. It's a decision you have to make. One of the things we're trying to say is, all right, but we can limit we can limit that. There are some things that are not subjective decisions you have to make, right? The actual numerical risk you run and the actual inputs into the risk are things that we can help people solidify more. And we've always been a little worried about trying to encroach upon that more individual aspect of things. We, we don't want to tell people, yes, you can do this, right? Because that is, I mean, first of all, assuming a degree of uh, risk and possibly liability that we neither ethically nor legally want. But second, because the person has to make their own decisions about uh, what are they willing to tolerate. And so what we can tell you is, you know, what what is the factual situation that you should be imagining when you are deciding uh, what value to place on different outcomes. But yeah, I, I agree with you that one of the things that makes the site valuable is helping refresh and update people's intuitions about what's what should feel dangerous, what should feel safe. Thank you. And one one more quick note on hugs is before we had micro COVID, um, our pod had figured out, um, well, we know COVID is a respiratory disease. And that means you have to inhale COVID to get it. So we had a policy of it's okay to have outdoor masked hugs while holding your breath. And like that really got through to a lot of people like, oh, I'm doing a thing to be safer mm -hmm. during this hug. Yeah, to give a little bit of context though, Frida, do you wanna say just a, a short bit about what your research is about as well? Because that will kind of, elaborate on why you have this concern i think and you look very eccentric like a almost like a villain with your parrot on your shoulder by the way <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so i'm a, a sort of a cheese student at the moment uh in liverpool and i'm investigating how older 
adults experiencing this pandemic and I'm looking into uh, the disconnectedness between families. I'm looking about ageism and I'm looking about belongingness as well. And, and hacking is one of the part which makes people feel they belong to a specific group and they feel um, it has a huge impact on their well-being when they can't hack. So it, it's kind of loneliness, depression, anxiety, increasing. And, and this leads to further consequences and not being able to live their, their daily life as they want to. And um, so th this has really a huge impact on, on the mental well-being. And that's why I think it's it's really important. And they were all really uncertain. What can we do? And all, you know, all over the world, no one knows what, what would have been the, the appropriate uh, behavior from all of us so and they were of course disadvantaged when they had to stay at home and if we would have such kind of tool in, in future terms it would make people more confident what can they do and, and and assure them reassure them that hacking is not a problem which to to you know to as a basic need, as a human basic need. So that's why I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm in a qualitative approach. That's why I would like to encourage you to follow up what people did. What, what did they think? Uh, did they feel more confident? Have they had drawbacks when they used them? They got COVID, for example, uh, whilst they're using it. Um, and I would, I would really encourage um, to look at the other side as well. Thanks, Thank Alfreda. Thank um, you, but I have to go. I'm sorry, I have to go. It was really interesting. Thanks very much. Thanks, Alfreda, for your questions. Um, have we got any more questions from the audience? If anyone would like to unmute their microphone. And if not, I would like to ask, uh, how do you deal with conflicting information? Because obviously there's so many different papers out there giving different data. And I know a few methods of being able to combine information, provide like a, a kind of joint distribution. But obviously with uh, the guesstimate situation you have to provide like a certain distribution mm -hmm. and it kind of oversimplifies or might go with one of the papers that's perhaps more up to date when a paper from a different country might have uh information or data that's conflicting yeah if that makes sense so this this might be overconfident in our like the depth of our research. But my experience was that there was very little conflicting information. And I don't mean that we that all the numbers were the same, but almost every paper on the same topic had overlapping conflict controls. And that brought us a lot of confidence that these numbers are somewhere in this range. Um, in some cases, we would, you know, pick a meta analysis that would pick the number and defer to some other researcher for how to combine these data. In a lot of cases, we would see a paper with a conflicting value, conflicting confidence intervals, and then do a dive on the paper and determine that actually this paper was not measuring the thing that everyone else was measuring, or they had a major uh, flaw in the study, which was a recurring challenge for us to, you know, we find a paper on a topic that we want to report on for microcode and it's not measuring the topic uh, at all. For instance, um, the, the vaccine efficacy changing during Delta was extremely difficult to find um, data that was isolating the efficacy of a vaccine from uh, the behaviors of uh, someone who was vaccinated. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I'll add a couple of things on that if I can. Um, one is that some of this comes back to the question of absolute versus relative risk. Uh, it's, I and the people I know generally use a calculator in what I think of as the much simpler way, which is for a given activity, look up, you know, does this look high risk or low risk and what could affect it the most, uh, you know, powerfully which is very different from looking and trying to say, what is my actual numerical risk of getting COVID over a certain amount of time with a certain number of interactions? So for that situation, you know, we say that wearing a cloth mask reduces your risk of getting COVID by about 50%. Wearing a well-sealed N95 reduces it by about seven eighths. Doing it outside reduces it by about 95%. And, you know, in terms of intuitions and in terms of uh, behavior modification, 
it's it's not as important if any of those numbers is off by a factor of two or something. You know, it still communicates very effectively, and I think we are very confident that a cloth mask helps, a well sealed N95 helps much more. Doing something outside a distance of more than about uh, three feet from someone helps much much more than that. And those are things right. that, and so those are things where I think it would have been a mistake for us to say that the existing uncertainty uh, le should lead us to not make those recommendations at all. On okay. the other hand, there are things, oh, go ahead. On the other hand, um, like one topic of, that, that is right now incredibly uncertain is what are your risks of developing long COVID symptoms? How much are they modified by whether you're vaccinated? How closely are they related to the severity of the original illness? We've had discussions about whether we should bring those into the calculator or at least make some kind of statement about them and how they should modify people's risk. And we have uh, made the decision to just not have an official position on that because it is too uncertain at this point. And maybe that's some place where giving people a false sense of certainty would be more harmful than helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. That's uh, there's music to my ears, actually. I thought there'd be way more uncertainty or conflicting information. So if most of the evidence aligns, that's really good news. Um, yeah. And with your... Sure. I Sorry. invite you to like have a look at our the research sources section of right. our white paper because it's just pages and pages of here are like the six studies we found and the ranges that they found and how we picked from them. Mm. And like each one is a it could be its own case study. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Um, and just to to go back to your point about the absolute versus relative risk in terms of people digest the relative risk uh, more easily. Um, this is something we've been discussing a lot in our institute, actually, um, and especially within a medical context. We had a speaker quite recently called Gergi Grenza, if you're not familiar with him. He has a TED talk that you can find quite easily on YouTube. Um, and they're very much trying to educate people in medical institutions to stop talking relative risk and try and talk more in absolute risk, or at least provide the relative risk mm -hmm. alongside the, the absolute risk. And let people make their own decisions because sometimes relative risk can be quite misleading yes. even though it's more easily processed it doesn't quite give people mm -hmm. an accurate picture and can therefore it can can be spun quite easily by either journalists or by software designers to kind of press their their cause if you want to be completely yeah. objective it's obviously better to to give more of the truth rather than trying to spin it in a relative yeah uh, i think persuasive way yeah, I think the examples of relative risk going badly wrong that I'm most mm. familiar with are ones where you have a very, very small base rate and then a very large proportional increase in the base rate that is still very small right. compared to anything else. And, you know, the examples that I think that, that some of the methods Gigerenzer talks about are helping people envision absolute risk in terms of like number of people out of 100,000 or something like that. Right. I think, I think in the case of COVID, uh, we're not in that situation. We're in a situation where everyone knows the risk is reasonably high and where they already have a high level of concern. And so we're starting from a base rate where relative uh, changes are more reasonable. So I agree that ultimately you somehow need to be based in an absolute understanding of risk. Um, but I think in our case, I think in our case, we haven't run into anything where that can go badly wrong, but I no. definitely take the point there. I actually yeah. much more agree with the rel the absolute risk being the important thing that microcode gives. Um, and so you could easily imagine if COVID were a hundred times worse, then it wouldn't matter whether you were outside or inside, the risk would still be unacceptably high. Right. So if we were talking about Ebola or a thing mm -hmm. with the fatality rate of Ebola then your risk budget would be, you know, decimal percents per year. Mm. And then mo kind of all of these precautions would be insufficient. And the, f the value that micro COVID gives is the absolute risk. And we're saying, hey, this is like in the reasonable range. It also so happens that people are more or less tuned to a sort of reasonable range. So I think if people were already tuned to a sort of reasonable range where they're like, oh, like grocery shopping is like, okay. And then we can like give relative things around that set point. But for people who are worried, you know, 
who have no idea of what their risk budget should be, you do need kind of an absolute lock against something else. Um, what in a similar sense, if COVID were actually way less risky than it was, like it were the flu, then talking about like a two X reduction in getting the flu is somewhat silly. Just get the flu. Like, go do go live your life. Yeah. Well, the so I, I agree with you all, but I just wanted to go off on a tangent on that, which is um, when we were looking at long COVID risk, one of the things that came out of some of the papers is that the risk of post-viral like persistent symptoms are surprisingly high. And the risk of getting symptoms like that from the flu is also quite surprisingly high. Uh, and one of the things I've heard a number of times in discussions about this is, gosh, maybe we should have been more worried about the flu all these years. Uh, but, you know, because it was something that people intuitively accepted and because it was something that uh, prior to 2020, it seemed unimaginably costly to try and prevent it. Uh, we just sort of accepted it. So that's uh, that's the situation though sometimes, again, come into conflict. Absolutely. I, thanks. Thanks for your comments. I think uh, Nick would like to ask a question as well, if you'd like to. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak up. I've been very, I've been very quiet. Uh, it's a very interesting talk, uh, you know, and, and you know, I appreciate the the difficulty of the endeavor, of all these little these decisions to make. Um, on the the relative risk thing, I mean, this has helped focus my thinking on it a little bit. If if there's some risk that you're very worried about, right? Like there's almost there's, there's sort of a steps here in the decision process. You know, the, the, the relative risk pitfall example I remember was the risk of, I think, colon cancer from eating a hamburger, right? And hamburger, eating a hamburger would double your risk of colon cancer, but the base rate was one in a million or whatever. It was a very low, right? And it had been a massive headline, eating hamburgers doubles your rate of cancer. When you're going to go in to have a surgery, or 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 if you're looking at at some public health situation, uh, you know, first you kind of need to ask, is is the absolute risk high, or or am I seeing am I seeing a lot of risk here, right? So we in COVID, we we've, we've seen a lot of people affected by it. We're already past that first step, and then once you're past the first step, you're into conditional probabilities, like you know, how, how can I how can I affect my risk of this this bad thing, and that led me to think that um, one way of approaching this would rather than thinking of activities that increase how much does this increase my rate? Um, your, your risk budget could be posed as uh, how how do I lower my rate? I, I was wondering if you if you both would be relative in a relative sense, and you uh, you guys were just talking about. Ha, you know, having your risk or something of flu not being not being a big deal or something. But um, I, I certainly, you know, I got, I've been extremely risk averse through this whole thing. I don't go to the grocery store. I don't, you know, <laughs> unless I absolutely have to. Um, I, you know, and I've been trying to figure out how to rationally think about the whole thing. If there was some max case, you take a totally gregarious person who takes no precautions and then ask how taking precautions reduces the risk. There would be obviously some that are trivial um, in their effect. Uh, would, do you think you would come up with different advice starting from the top and working down? Um, yeah, so I, I think this does come down to like these two camps that micro COVID users fall into. Um, one is like, I am doing things, I'm like, and maybe I should look at, are there easy things that I could do to make things less risky? And that uh, maybe comes down to like, maybe I shouldn't go to that bar. Maybe I should eat outside instead of inside. Maybe I should wait a few days before seeing my parents. Um, and so that's like the kind of relative risk focused cohort. And then there's the uh, cohort that's like coming from zero risk that says, well, I really don't want any bad results from COVID. And we say, well, will you accept risks from COVID that are equivalent to risks that you take in every other year? Your risk of bad things from driving, your risk of bad things from flying, your risk of 
you know, random death from humans tending to do that now and then. Um, and then for that cohort, the absolute matters a lot where you're like, I need to match this. I guess it becomes like the relative to something that isn't COVID. Right, right. You're, you're setting some, them, some, that other, some other base. That's what you're trying to lock against because there are, no one has a like, you know, what percent chance am I willing to have of, you know, having breathing difficulty for the rest of my life? You're like zero, probably. But really, like, if you get in a car, it's not zero. If you eat a hamburger, it's not zero because that can cause heart disease, which is going to make it harder for you to do exercise for the rest of your life. Yeah. One of the, if this had been more of a user experience focused talk, I would have gone into more detail on kind of some of the issues we had with optimizing our UI for choosing different things on the site. And that ran into really interesting issues where part of our goal is to reflect Part of, part of our goal is just let you enter what you're doing and see what the risk is. And part of it is to educate the user and show them like which things matter more and which things matter less. Um, and so we do try to expose things on the site that that do communicate regardless, you know, which things matter most and what are the things you can do to modify your risk. Yeah, thank you. Um, and. I'd like to ask one one last question before we wrap up. Um, is there anything that you feel like a particular blind spots that you would like kind of either support or kind of anything you're unsure of that you'd like us to to think about? Maybe we're going to record this talk and upload it onto onto our website and share it amongst the other researchers as well, so they can kind of follow up and and contact you perhaps if if you'd like any any support or assistance from our, our expertise. at all, if there's anything yeah, that comes so to mind. There's a couple of things that come to mind. Um, one is, as I mentioned, our analysis of our uncertainty is right. completely out of date, doesn't take into account new research, doesn't take into account um, new multipliers we've added. It's probably larger, and we haven't had the time or expertise to even go about tackling that. Um, in terms of like, where I see the limitations of microcode that I would like to right. see improved. Um, we know that we're probably pretty off for schools and workplaces where we have this linear model around one hour and then we try to extrapolate to 40 hours, which is kind of a little bit far out of that research. Um, we know that we have a glaring omission around tests. So if you're going to an activity and you get rapid tests beforehand or a PCR test some of days before. Right. Uh, that has no way to be entered in micro COVID and something I'm working on now. Um, yeah, Michael, do you think there are any other questions that we're not doing a great job of answering right now? I agree about schools. Like our users are really hurting for that. Um, it's, it's very hard and I think we currently give probably pretty bad uh, answers about school situations. So if folks are familiar with either empirical work on what's the, what's the actual risk of transmission in school settings, or how would you theoretically address that more effectively than the way we do, I think that could be right. a really valuable contribution. Yeah, I think from, from my experience, this is kind of how I approach my own research is by using imprecise probabilities. So where you're not entirely sure what the exact probability might be and you give a range of probabilities to, to be more honest about your, your projection. So say that the chance of you getting COVID when you have a certain amount of people that are COVID positive within a school, and it may be around 20 to 40% likely uh, likelihood of transmission rather than giving 30% necessarily and how that might affect your, your risk tolerance, your risk budget afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I believe Nick might actually be from Applied Biomathematics. He's, uh, so you're familiar with Scott Furson. He's the chair of our institute. Um, and he, uh, he's used probability bounds analysis and imprecise uh, probability. And that's kind of a big part of our institute. But unfortunately, there's not many of us here today. Um, 
But do you think that would be Nick? I don't know whether you're using imprecise yeah, I, probabilities. I thought work. Scott would be here, and if he I know. Here, then this would have come up much earlier. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, well, I was. I mean, I'm curious about that. I think. I, I, you know, I, I was, I, I was kind of prepping to argue about this in the discussion. Oh, there's got to be uncertainty, but I think, I think, you know, your, your answer is that uh, it's always, it's always this case. I mean, I know, it's, I know you can uh, sympathize with this, Francis. That, that um, first of all, adding that uncertainty doesn't necessarily always change your guidance. Right, it would make the categories fuzzier, and it would make them overlap a lot. And ultimately, no matter how hard you tried to draw that figure or whatever it was, the user would, you know, look at the midpoints of things. And and uh, it's very seldom that you get, oh, I don't know, nonlinear effects or something that that actually significantly move where that midpoint would be. Um, particularly and it looks like in this model, if we're just multiplying a bunch of things. Uh, I, I, I mean, it'd be really interesting to see what it looked like if the whole thing was done in interval and it looks like something you could actually pop out in risk calc or, or, or whatever, uh, uh, to, you know, however you want to do that. Yeah. But I have a feeling that you would just end up with a lot of overlapping categories. So and then what does, a, you know, there's always the question, what does a person do with the guidance that going to the grocery score, store increases your risk by anywhere from 0.2 to 1.6 microcovids? You know, it, it, it's difficult to process. Yeah, so, and just to, just to echo that quickly, I think uh, from my experience as well, when you start to introduce those imprecise probability bounds, it does tend to lose people. And an alternative to that might just be having the ability to put input your own data, which you already have, where you encourage people to maybe say, if they're unsure about a certain value, maybe they could provide a range rather than a precise value, but not doing that yourself because it'd be quite difficult to give that to every specific location that you've embedded within your, your module already. I just wanna make a data point problem. about uh, like displaying risk uncertainty and that's, we display a range in the final output of the calculator. It's not, you know, as precisely calculated as I might like, but for the most part, users are blind to it. Mm -hmm. Like users will, we've had people come up with tickets. And it's like, Hey, you should display your, your, you know, confidence bounds. And we're like, it's right there, like next to the result. And <laughs> yeah. no one sees it. And no one's asked about it. I don't know if um, Michael, have you? Has anyone? I I did about notice that, that by the way. I did notice that. Sorry, go on, Michael. No, I haven't seen anyone notice it either. Yeah, I uh, I thought when I saw it, I noticed that the the big bold number was the precise value, and then in a much lighter font was the kind of the interval, but it by the way that it's presented, it kind of draws attention away from it rather than putting that at the front value of saying, this is the uncertainty about it. And this is our best guess of what that value is or best approximation based on the available data, you know? But I think the way that you present it is really important, at least in my research, when the graphs that I have are more kind of, they present these values more widely in the, the graph of the upper and lower interval and then they're kind of aligned mm -hmm. with the median value but I think the traffic light system doesn't really accommodate for that. And it kind of oversimplifies that to some extent, but it's also the way that's most publicly understandable for the kind of layman person. Yeah, and then this is a case where I, I do agree on with Michael on the relative things of like the, if you're looking at a scenario, there's quite a broad scale of uncertainty and that is maybe gonna come a lot from how many people actually have COVID and what is the base hourly rate and what is the air filtration? But then if you're seeing, you know, how can I improve my outcome? You're probably messing with things like your mask because that's the thing you can actually control or how far away from people are you trying to stay. And so you get these like very big ranges that overlap, but in reality, the, the thing that you care about is the ratio between those ranges. 
Absolutely. Um, have we got any? Do you have any last closing comments, Nick? Before I before I wrap up. Oh I, no, I'm good. I enjoyed your talk. Okay. Though. Yeah, thank you so much, both both of you, for your for your talk. It was really really fascinating, and just a, a really noble endeavor. I don't, I think it's a really hard task to do, and that's why so few people few people have attempted to do something similar. Um, so yeah, I just really respect and admire your work and please do stay in touch. I'll post the talk uh, and pass it along to my fellow researchers that couldn't make it today. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much for your opportunity. Really looking forward to uh, discussing further. Okay, thank you. Okay, good morning and uh, see you, you later. Bye. Good night.